And now I want to continue to discuss that. What I'm going to do now, if, with your tolerance, I'm going to be reading part of the article so that, and then commenting on it, okay? Uh, I want to continue because you see, the suppression of the truth becomes a society driven plot. And people who break out of that suppression are normally persecuted. Because when the when the truth is suppressed, the truth is God, the existence of God. Uh, and that means the mind must go from uh, explaining to understanding. And it's a work of the will to yield to that and get to the understanding level. If you block that off, you see, then you're living an incomplete life. And what happens is, as I'm going to point out, uh, your drives go crazy. Especially, and that's how Paul ends this Romans 1 letter, as you, as you know, with homosexuality. Because in a culture where there's this societal agreement to rest with explanation, we can make the world go round. We can make people fly to the moon on explanation. We don't need understanding. Understanding is another level of the mind, which includes understanding source and therefore God in some way. And that people rebel against, and therefore they don't want that. As that text I just read uh, from Ephesians says, right? They no longer walk. As the, why? The empty futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them caused by the hardness of their heart. Such people, devoid of any moral sensitivity, have given themselves over to unrestrained self-indulgence, carrying out every sort of impurity with a lust for more. And opponents of that are treated very harshly. Uh, whereas people who want to keep a happy, fat, non-questioning populace, the government wanting to do that, will encourage this society, will encourage this culture. Everybody's happy. Have enough to eat, have enough sexual pleasure, and so forth. So, what else do we need? You could need thinking out, what are you going to do when you die? Is, that all, is this all there is to life, this existence here? Is 70 years? Is that it? Or is there more? And if there's more, to whom are we responsible for this more. See? And that's our dilemma. That's why I'm doing this and I'm stopping the other text because I was going too fast over this. I, I think it's very important to grasp the teaching here. So, I'm going back now to, uh, to talk about suppression. And I'm going to read and then comment, if that's alright. If we return now to St. Paul's statement that the suppression of the truth is an act of ungodliness and injustice, a sevia keadikia. We must first ask at what dimension of knowledge this suppression takes place. So I'm going to look at what does this suppression do? See, First, however, it is important to realize that this suppression is initially personal on the part of some leaders who shape the culture and then also communal or cultural and that the resulting lack of knowledge of God and the consequences of this become embodied in the institutions and thought world of the society, so that people who don't follow this are a threat. And uh, that's why the Christians were martyred. See, they didn't... See, the world is governed by forces, some good, some bad. We know them as demons, you know, or angels, but you see, and that's all there is. Whereas... Jews and Christians went to the creator of the universe and got their direction for life from him. So, when they were martyring St. Polycarp, at 90 years old, they're going to burn him at the stake. And the charge against him was atheos. He was an atheist. He didn't worship the gods of the establishment. Now, we wouldn't say that after 2,000 years of Christianity, but we do say, opposed to the good of the society, opposed to the direction of the society, opposed to the same thing. 
if you just don't use the word God. Uh, this suppression, Paul calls, ungodly and unjust. But it's deep in the spirit, see? It's like a, when you're a little kid and you put your head under the pillow to pretend you're hiding from your mother or father. You know, We put our head under the pillow and think, now there's no God. Uh, but it's not only personal, you see, it becomes communal. And then there is a communal conspiracy not to get God into the thing. Not mention God. Why? Because deep in every human spirit is this call to reach God. That people don't want, don't know enough, aren't helped enough, to, so they don't want it. They want to enjoy what they've got, including money and sex and so forth, and not even think of death. And that becomes a societal plot not just an individual plot. And that's what Paul is talking about. It's a critique of the culture of his day. It's a critique of our own culture. And that's why I wanted to take the time to go back and, and trace out more in detail its, its cause. It is important to realize that this suppression is initially personal on the part of some leaders who shape the culture, and then also communal or cultural, and that the resulting lack of the knowledge of God and the consequences of this become embodied in the institutions and thought world of the society. And therefore, you're a freak if you continue to pray to God, look to God, love God. Paul is condemning a culture and is uncovering with the help of what had already been revealed to God's people the root cause of an aberration that is so mysteriously easy to generate and perpetuate and finally results in a culture that becomes a bondage. Because then people start to worship idols. Different kinds of idols. They might not put up a statue. and we're, An idol is what? It is something of ultimate concern. Whenever anything but God is of ultimate concern, you're worshiping an idol. It could be money, power, reputation, sex, whatever you want. Ultimate concern. Okay. Um, the following description of culture may help to understand well, what I mean by a culture and then enculturated and produce, as it always does, an anti-culture. The description that I'm reading is positive, but you can see how the factor of a culture can be realized there. Culture, and this is a, from the Willow Bank Report, the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization, 1978. Culture is an integrated system of beliefs about God or reality or ultimate meaning or values about what is true, good, beautiful, and normative of customs, how to behave, relate to others, talk, pray, dress, work, play, farm, eat, and of institutions which express those beliefs, values, and customs. And that's what binds a society together and gives it a sense of identity, dignity, security, and continuity. One of the prized expressions of this in our culture is the uh, statement printed in the record on the Supreme Court in the case of the uh, state of Pennsylvania versus Casey, that it is the right of every human being to declare for him or herself the ultimate meaning of life. That's our Supreme Court. I have a right to determine. Suppose I determine the meaning of life is for me to go baby, boil babies in oil. That's the meaning of life for me. I mean, no. I mean, it's deeper than that, you see? Uh, and so, but it becomes a culture, you see? It becomes a way. And then people who go against that are considered a threat and enemies. Now, the transference from being a Christian culture to being a militantly atheist culture has been astonishingly rapid. And people who don't 
follow this, you know, are considered to be at least, uh, what shall I call them, uh, holding up progress. So people, for instance, who think that abortion is wrong, or that same-sex marriage is unnatural, they're holding up the advance of the human race, and they should be eliminated, because we've got to move on. That's the illusion. That's the illusion. I wanted to take the time to do that. I'm going to go on a little bit more now. Uh, because as I've been working, as you know, on reason and faith, but I felt we needed to put it into a context of culture. And uh, so I returned to this study, which is also on, on the existence of God, but which begins with this notion of culture, okay? Um, you see, when I talk about suppression, it is an act of the person and not only of the mind. It's the person who suppresses. It's the person who sins, not just the mind. And this is created so that we have a culture by the multiple choices of many to refuse to allow the mind to look for ultimates. That is, to be content with explanation and not understanding. But explanation, you can fly to the moon. You can explain the qualities of steel and rockets and directions and magnets and whatever you need to fly to the moon and never understand what you're doing. There's another function. And that's, um, uh, as I say, it was this Diltai who first labeled it, but it's obvious. And um, uh, important. The principle, I'm going to read a little bit more and then we'll be finished. Therefore, the higher forms of knowledge demand a greater self-involvement on the part of the knower, who must also finally become a lover. If we bear this in mind, I think we can understand Paul's indictment. He is not saying that God's self-manifestation in and through creation presents itself as compelling evidence, like water expands at 4 degrees centigrade. That's compelling evidence for that. It is rather an invitation to yield to the evidence and follow its lead. Refusal to do this is a form of human action, a praxis that can create an anti-culture. That's where we are. You see? It's, it's willed rather than follow the impulse of the mind, you see? To, uh, to move on. It's an act of the will to stop the mind from asking further. Recently, one of the famous atheists, I won't mention his name, but he writes books evangelizing for atheism, said himself, on a scale of one to seven, he's six and I think half, or something sure, there is no God. That leaves a rather significant figure, and yet he's trying to evangelize the whole world, and he's not quite sure himself? That's quite astonishing. All right, that's enough of that.